Thank you again so much for coming. We have today seven brand new journalists to Faith Angle. We have uh, seven advisors who are here who help sort of anchor and structure the direction of the project. Uh, we, have, we have a journalist who's here from France in Laura. Uh, so thank you for coming all those many thousands of miles. Uh, thousands of miles. And, and um, uh, uh, when we finish hearing from David first and from uh, Reverend Walton, from Jonathan second, uh, if you want to get in, and even if you want to get in while they're talking, if you just signal with your car, either by putting it up uh, or by just getting attention, we'll keep a list here, as is a long tradition, and you can get in for a thick conversation because we want this to be big think and participatory. Um, you have uh, the bios of our speakers today in your program, so I'm not gonna wax on and on. Um, just wanna say a quick word or two. Uh, uh, Jonathan, uh, of course, is a man of the cloth. He's the Dean uh, of Wake Forest. Uh, Divinity School. He's also a dean of its chapel um, and has written two books, one in 18 uh, called A Lens of Love, Reading the Bible in Its World for Our World, and then another in 09, a decade earlier, called Watch This, The Ethics and Aesthetics of Black Televangelism that looks at the theological and political traditions of uh, African-American religious broadcasters. Uh, broadcasters. Um, he earned a PhD and an MDiv from Princeton and I recommend, if you haven't had enough of a jolt from your, from your own caffeine, finding his sermons online, including one at Riverside Church recently that was uh, wonderful to listen to yesterday. Um, David uh, is uh, probably known to you as well. Uh, his first of two books also was Eyewitness to Power, sort of telling the story of being a senior advisor to four different um, uh, you know, presidents. Um, and. Uh, uh, I took away from his class as a student in 03. He sees around the corner, so you just want to kind of hang out and see, see what, what, what uh, Professor Gergen uh, sees, because uh, you can learn a lot from it. Um, and he also believes that agency matters, that character matters, and that's a big part of leadership, and leadership's real. And he has a new book. His second book is coming out in May 10th uh, from Simon & Schuster, and it is called uh, Hearts Touched with Fire, um, and I recommend it. Uh, so look for that. And if you've got a podcast, maybe you want to have them on your show um, or uh, otherwise help, help promote it. Also uh, the founding director of the Center for Public Leadership at the Kennedy School. So we wanted basically a conversation on declining trust uh, because we've been observing that it's getting worse. Uh, and Alan has all the numbers um, to sort of anchor today. Uh, we wanted sort of a public or a political angle. But then we thought like it'd be great to find um, a story of friendship, a story of actual, uh, you know, collegiality and, and, and cooperation in some way. And I think Nicole had this idea. Uh, David and Jonathan, uh, that would be it. Uh, if you could find a story of a David and a Jonathan, it'd be perfect. And wouldn't you know, uh, these two guys, um, they, they used to travel together, they used to speak together, they've got some history. Um, uh, uh, Jonathan was the, uh, followed, uh, Peter Gomes at Harvard as uh, the professor of, um, of, of, of the plumber professor of Christian morals. And uh, so when he was there and overlapped with David, they would do some events together. So we're drawing on a little bit of, little, little bit of history. Um, thank you guys so much for coming. Dave will speak first, followed by Jonathan, followed by you. Welcome to Faith Angle. And David, the floor is yours. Good. Thank you very much, Josh. And uh, I want to thank all of you for the invitation to come here. I did not know about the existence of this group. Uh, before, before, but I discovered that you're doing wonderful work. And I think this is, a, you, um, I think you're a model of what we're looking for now is more conversation at the community level among people who not, don't necessarily know each other, but can learn from each other and can learn to respect each other. And <clears throat> I mean, it's remarkable. There are people here who have been here for 22 years, 22 years doing this, this conversation. It must be very enriching. So I congratulate you on that. And of course, it's good to be here with Jonathan. Uh, we knew each other for the, we've known each other for several years now, yeah. and uh, he's, he's I'm sorry, such an outstanding choice uh, to come here as a speaker. He, he's the one who really understands religion far better than I do and <clears throat> can speak to it. Um, actually, I'm a little surprised to come here as um, I, I'm sort of a late in life kind of addition to this. Uh, I'm, I'm very I've become very sympathetic. <clears throat> I tell people. Um, with an old fellow who was walking through the woods one day and he heard this sound and, and he looked down, he couldn't see anything. And then he looked down again, he heard a sound again, looked down and there was a frog by the side of the path. And the frog looked up at him and said, if you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. And he said, hmm, oh, wow. 
but he didn't do anything. Then the frog climbed up his jacket and said, if you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess. Didn't, didn't you hear me? And he said, yeah, I heard you all right, but at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of that place in politics in America right now. It's uh, I, what we see in Washington is I think, um, it's really very deeply concerning. It's gone on and on and on. If this were a flashpoint, if something sort of significant happened and we were through it in a few days or a few weeks, you wouldn't feel that way. But it's it's a cascade of crises that we've been going through that people, generally Americans are exhausted. They want all this to go away. They can't understand why the pandemic is lingering. They don't want to get involved in Ukraine if they can help it. Uh, but they generally speaking have just sort of signed off on politics. <clears throat> they, it is not, it hasn't worked for them. It's been, there have been a massive series of, of failures. This is something I, I try to breach in a broad way in the book that uh, Josh first so kindly uh, recommended. <clears throat> and I use this, the phrase and the title, Hearts Touch with Fire, partly because I really like the phrase. Uh, but it also came to symbolize something for me. Um, it comes from a, the experience of Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr., who was a, from a prominent family in Boston, Cambridge. Uh, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, Jr. went on to the Supreme Court. He was named to the court by Teddy Roosevelt, and he lasted up through Franklin Roosevelt. But in any event, when the Civil War came, Holmes was from a very prominent family in Boston. He could easily have ducked the war. He could easily have walked away from it and found an excuse not to go. And instead he volunteered to join the Massachusetts Regiment. And he went forward, he was grievously wounded three times. The last time he was wounded, in the last battle, he was given up for dead. And yet he survived. And 20 years later, he gave a talk reflecting on what it was like to, to be of service when he was young in the war and so grievously wounded. And he said it was up, up every man, and he would say woman today, obviously, um, should engage in the passions of their time. And he said our generation, the one that went to war, engaged in those passions and our hearts were touched with fire. They looked upon it for the rest of their lives as the high point of their life and when they had given the most back and that was a significant you know, achievement for that period of time. But I think it captures how important it is to, to encourage people to get into the public arena. My, the book, my book is, is essentially a call to the younger generations to get into the arena, to make the good fight, to have the perseverance to see it through. Change is extremely hard, but it's really critically necessary where we are now. And so it's, it, it's I hope it will be a call I also, um, it's ri written as a practical guidebook for the younger generation, for generation millennials and for Gen Z. Um, and it's not all, it's not all sweetness and light. What I, I, I but I do believe, I, I, I describe myself as a short-term pessimist, but a long-term optimist. And a lot of my optimism comes from working with these students in classrooms and having a chance to spend time with them and realizing how much promise there is in these new younger generations. I believe very strongly it's time for the older generations, people like me, to get off the stage, to make way for new fresh blood and fresh thinking and fresh aspiration. And that's what I think the younger generations can do for us, can serve that purpose. But we have, they have to be encouraged. They have to know the way up. And so I've, I've, I've included a sort of a practical playbook for here's how, here's how you can make the most impact. Here are the ways that people, and it's so interesting right now, the impact and the change that is coming is coming in some cases from teenagers like Greta Thunberg, or it's coming you know, from Black Lives Matter. These three women that formed this are all women, there are three black women who are in, they're young. Or look at the Parkland kids that came out of uh, Florida. They're, they're really in David Hogg and the others who came out of that. They were all extremely young and yet they've had They've encouraged us to believe that it can be done again. We've had the biggest marches in American history, you know, coming out of essentially people who are on college campuses who are just a little older. And that I think is, is suggestive, uh, at least as an overview, you know, I would argue that, that I'd like to think, think of this conversation as one which, which realizes that yes, we're, we're in a deep hole right now. We're in one hell of a mess, but there is hope to get out of this. And Americans want to have hope, and they believe in leaders who they can trust and they can have hope in. Now, one critical element of that, 
uh, is the degree to which they trust not only the leaders, but the institutions, uh, that the civic institutions, the religious institutions, the other kind of institutions in our society, that they can look up to them and find role models. They can find heroes. Uh, uh, Michelle and I were talking last night about the lack of heroes uh, in the country right now. We just don't, you know, we're the Zelenskys of the United States. Where, where are the people who are going to come forward with this? Uh, and I think we ought to be recognizing that as well. The, the arc of trust and then distrust in America uh, it was dramatic in the, starting in the 1930s, 1940s, but going up through the 1960s. The, as the United States went through that period, we had, we had some victories along the way. We had things that were you know, winning over the Great Depression winning over the Second World War, made people feel very, very positive about government. They made people feel positive about our leaders because they were delivering the goods. Uh, and it, and you, you just had to be there to see how patriotic people were. I, I first went to Washington when the World War II generation was running the show. And it's just changed dramatically in terms of the quality of people, what they believe in, how much hope they have, how much confidence they have in each other how much confidence they have in the future. They feel overwhelmed by it. And what you find is that the up through the, from the thirties up until the sixties and in the mid sixties, we had hit about 65 to 70% approval rating, not only by presidents, but of all civic institutions. We were up really, really high. And it made a big difference. When Eisenhower was president over the course of eight years, his average approval rating over the course of eight years was 65%. We've never, today our leaders struggle, our president struggle to get above 50. You know, Biden right now is at high 30s, low 40s. That is a huge drop from where we've been and incapacitates the government to get things done. Yeah, it's much, much harder to govern in this, in this environment than it has been before because there is so, so little trust. But what broke it, what, what we, how, the reason we went down so fast so far uh, was two things, Vietnam, and Watergate. Those two things killed uh, confidence in the structure of government. Uh, some example of why and when it matters. Uh, when Franklin Roosevelt first took office, 1933, and he took the presidency, uh, and the banks were in real trouble at that time. And he felt it really important to close the banks. Close the banks, give the government, uh, give the new administration a few days to try to correct some things and then reopen the banks, knowing it was going to be a great risk. Because when you reopen the banks, if people didn't have confidence in you, they were going to still flee. And if they fled, the economy was going to collapse. So it made a huge difference who showed up on Monday morning. And when, he got, when they got to work on Monday morning, there was a long line of people outside the banks waiting to put their money back in the bank, not take it out. And it saved the banks. But that came because of this uh, sense of trust that people had with, with institutions. And you can see that uh, time and again, you, you'll see those kind of uh, uh, examples. But when things broke, uh, then let's take another period. Much later, Ronald Reagan is president. Reagan believes very strongly that he is uh, a man of honor. And he, he wouldn't lie. You, you can agree or disagree with his policies, but he was honest. And he had sort of a tie with the American public because of the honesty. But then along came around Iran-Contra. And he was seen as having, having been in, deeply engaged in, do, in lying about a, an adventure that was terribly against our national interest. And as Richard Worthland, who was then the president's chief political advisor, uh, said, it broke that the Iran Contra broke the connection between Reagan and the public, and he he almost went down. He was almost sent packing by Congress. He he stayed in office by this, just this much, and he stayed in office because he went very public with everything. He cleared all the records. He put all of the people in his administration had to go up and testify. There was no hiding behind executive privilege. All the documents were available. Called back David Abshire to run things, run a tight ship. They did a super job, uh, as Carl Kennan will remember. They did a super job at cleaning things up, and he saved himself and his presidency by being as open and as transparent as he did, as he was. But it was really, really hard. One more example, going back to the way it once was. 
I, I talked about Eisenhower. Um, one of the really important events that from Eisenhower's point of view, the, and a hugely important event historically, he thought, uh, was late in his presidency, uh, we, we were having spy planes go over Russia. They were in, and Francis Gary Powers uh, was in one of those planes that went down. Uh, it, it appeared because of the crash that he was he himself died in it, but he also was carrying around something that he had, was supposed to take uh, some sort of medical thing to kill him if he were before he were cap was captured. It was really important. So Eisenhower assumed that Francis Gary Power was dead, and the plane was never found. And so he went out and claimed it was not a spy plane. It was basically a weather plane. And he lied about it to the country, very openly lied. Well, guess what? Khrushchev had in his, it had captured Francis Gary Powers and didn't tell anybody. He wanted to make sure nobody knew in the world that he had him. Uh, and because he thought that Eisenhower might make that mistake. And it was a calamity for Eisenhower for emotionally because he had, he felt that he was supposed to tell the truth. And he felt this is, this is, he almost resigned from the presidency. He discussed it with a friend because he was so, uh, um, kicking himself uh, for what he gotten into, but it was that it was that important to these people to maintain that trust. And what we're seeing now, of course, is the decline of trust that's across almost across the board. It's not quite, but ge as a general proposition, in almost every institution you can look at, and Jonathan is going to go into a lot more depth about faith institutions. But as a general proposition, in most areas, we've done gone down about thirty percent. And, and in terms of how much loss of trust there has been. Um, and that's, that's pretty sizable, but in most cases, we've gone from somewhere in the 60s down to somewhere in the 30s. The exception is the U.S. military. Uh, the U.S. military went through hell during Vietnam. It was distrusted, it was not, you know, wasn't delivery and so forth and so on. People lost confidence in the U.S. military uh, and their numbers plunged. Now, what's interesting about that military though, and what's important for a conversation like this to keep in your back of your mind is that the, uh, uh, the military went to work on trying to repair its relationship with the citizenry of the country. They began sending more of their top people, their generals and so forth. They sent them back to school. They tend to send them back to sort of get courses in ethics and things like that. Um, but they worked very, very hard to try to reestablish their credibility. And so they, the, as a general proposition, what you will find in recent years, especially since uh, Vietnam, but, it, but the fact that people like Colin Powell stayed in, decided not to go out, Colin could have made a lot of money on the outside. He stayed in to reform the military. Uh, and it was very, very successful. Uh, and now the military people are generally accorded high respect, higher than almost any other field. The three biggest, the, the three biggest winners in effect that Americans uh, accord uh, support for, a majority, majority approval for, are the military and small business. And there was one other, I'll remember it. Um, but in any event, they're, they're small, small, it's a small part of the universe. There are, there are three big institutions that, that chart all this stuff. One of them is by, uh, led by Richard Edelman. Uh, there is also the Pew studies and the Gallup studies. Um, but Edelman does a, is the one who does the best international uh, survey of attitudes. Uh, and he's, his lattice, and he works with Davos with the World Economic Forum. Uh, that's where they get it announced. That's where they do a lot of uh, CEOs take a hard look at things and they go through a lot of sessions like this to talk about where we are. Um, but, he, the, uh, but what Edelman has generally found is that the military survived, but the, but the government and the media went down the most here in the last few years. The government and media have gone down the most. The, um, and what's just surprising is that uh, more Americans are now looking to CEOs to help solve the problems of the country than they are to the government. And they want, they want CEOs and businesses to be part of the act. And I, th I do think that in any conversation like this, which is as broad based as this, I hope we'll touch upon the, the role of corporations in trying to restore trust. Because I think they, the, they are an important players at this. Well, what Americans have generally found is that they feel like there's been a massive uh, failure of leadership. And they're, they're, they're angry about it. 
Um, one thing, one item that's of concern to me personally, given the fact I, I place so much hope in the, in the younger generation, is that the young are more pessimistic than the older Americans. Um, and that is something to, to watch. Uh, I didn't know until recently, I read in Barron's, that the, um, in terms of world's population, uh, that um, half the world's population today is under the age of 27. Half the world's population is under the age of 27. And if they're pessimistic, it gets harder. It gets harder to get things done. But I do, I do believe what we, people ought to be looking at. So why should we be so concerned about trust in institutions? Well, it, it, the, the major point is you can't, I think you can't govern in terms of a public society if, you, if people don't trust you. There, you cannot put together majorities in the, in the House and the Senate if there's a lack of trust on what you're basically doing. Uh, and that, and so getting big things done, the failure to get big things done, we've, we've, in time after time, the environment, for example, the young look at this and say, my God, it's been clear for 20 years, 25 years, uh, what, what needs to be done? You're we're still fooling around with this. We can't seem to get it straight. I mean, we're simultaneously, you know, pursuing a climate policy right now, but while we're also trying to encourage more oil and gas and coal, uh, uh to be, you know, to come online. You know, we, we, what, we, what is our strategy? Uh, what are we trying to go? And that's what the young are asking to a, lar to a large extent. But there are other, there are other ways that they, I think the lack of uh, uh, trust in institutions has afflicted us. Uh, and that has to do with the, the rise in uh, mental health issues, uh, the degree of loneliness, the emphasis, the new emphasis we're putting on happiness, where can you find your happiness? Um, I, I don't particularly like the, that concept of happiness. It seems to me it, fulfillment is more, this is more about fulfillment. In any event, and there are a variety of ways in which uh, we pay a price for what's going on with, our, with the trust and how it's plunged. Then the question becomes, well, how do we restore it? Now, that's a bigger and harder question. Uh, and I, I, well, I hope we do spend some time in conversation today talking about how do we get out of this mess I'm sure you look at this sort of every year in one way or another, but I think we're at a particularly uh, dangerous moment now. I think we're it, it, things could go very badly in the next five years or so uh, for a variety of reasons, which we can talk about. But I, I, I do feel that, as the military has shown us, if we get our act together, if we start attracting you know, highly qualified, insp idealistic, inspired individuals to come to the aid of the country, uh, I think we're going to be much further along. Um, and that's one of the reasons I would strongly recommend. And I'm just, I'm in a group of, uh, that's growing, I hope, I think it is, of people who believe in national service. Uh, I, I really honestly believe one of the most important things we could do to improve the civic life of the country is to ask or encourage young people to give a year back in their communities. They doesn't, and by the way, it doesn't need to be in their communities. In many ways, it's best if you're from New York, that you do something out in the rural parts of Colorado, uh, or you, you understand what's going on in Kentucky or West Virginia. Uh, those, are, those are important you know, times to visit. Um, but the, uh, this, this, the need is for leaders who are more empathic, but are also more honest and are more realistic about where we are. I think we can, I do believe that over time, uh, we can make strong improvements. So we get that we if if there is a real national movement, it's like you know. So often, look at the late nineteenth century. You know when the, when the CEOs in a sense ran, ran the world and and ran it into a ground. We had the progressive movement to come along to reform it. Time and again, history has shown that in an existential moments, the United States does very well. In only one case, the Civil War did we really totally blow it. But if you look at the early days of the Republic. You know, we, we were right on the edge of, you know, Washington lost six of the first eight bi battles that he was engaged in. Um, and we were right on the edge, could have gone either way. And you had people come out of the woodwork and historians write about them. Where did we find these, these people who were world-class leaders? I mean, if you think about it, when we had three million people in this country, we had six world-class leaders. Now we have over, th over 300 million and we can't think of of six world-class leaders. We can't imagine who they are. 
And I, it's, it, it's just astonishing in that sense. But we came together then. Um, John Meacham has written a lot about this in a very nice way. And Doris has written about it. There are others who, who have contributed to this. Um, but if you go, go through it, we had, so we, we succeeded in the, in the war for the Republic. We failed in the Civil War. That was a big one. But we succeeded on the Depression. And we succeeded in the World War II. Those were all existential events. And, and we ought to remember them as we go through this because it gives, I can't tell you how much people want an element of hope in their lives. That they just see this as, it's a, this is a dark chapter for a lot of Americans going through this. It's especially dark for people of color because we haven't, we simply haven't made the guy gains we thought we would make by now. Uh, and so there's a lot, of, if you look at where the, the trust factor, to go back to this now, stop. If you look at the trust factor, the people who have the most trust are whites, they're higher income, they have better educations, they have access to medical care. And the, those are the ones who have expressed high confidence. The people, the people who don't have those things, those are the ones who are really pessimistic. And that we have to face that reality if we're divided by questions like this is one more division in the country. And I, I do think it's imperative on us uh, to repair that degree of trust uh, in our institutions, if we're going to get out of this mess, if we're going to have votes that are bipartisan in the Congress, if we're going to have people who can get along with each other, people who can sort of have, you know, those those experiences where they find each other. I mean, one of the wonderful stories out of World War II, for example, is that Bob Dole and, and, and Senator Inouye, one a Republican, one a Democrat, they were both injured, they were both shot in, in the Italian campaign. They both wound up in the same hospital. They both got to know each other in the same hospital. They became close friends. That, fr that friendship was with them all their lives. And they worked together through, throughout the years they were together in the Senate because they believed in each other. They'd been on this common mission because they had fought under the same flag they could work together. And we have to, the, the National Service would uh, encourage people to give a year back, to get a one year re reduction in your tuition. So you've got a, uh, a, an incentive for it, financial incentive, to pay them some, but to give them real jobs and to do things that you're, the, the regular workforce is not going to do. The most popular program that Franklin Roosevelt had was the old CCC, the Civilian Conservation Corps. Uh, and he went out in the spring of 33. He'd just been, just been inaugurated. And he, he said, we're gonna build this, this uh, Civilian Conservation Corps. And by that summer, he had, we had 250,000 young men in the woods and forests of the United States rebuilding the parks uh, and opening the way. And that program, there were, mil there were millions of young people, guys, but they were at least, they, at least there were black, blacks involved in that and, and volunteered for it. Um, yeah, women were not not part of it. But nonetheless, the CCC gave people a bond that stuck with them all their lives. And that's what, that's what we should be encouraging. How do we find the leaders who can encourage that? How do we find and identify and work with the younger people to prepare them for lives of service and leadership? Thank you, I'll stop there. Well, I wanna give everybody the opportunity to, if they wanna ask, I mean, that was so rich and engaging. I'm sure that there might be some people that have some uh, thoughts or reflections. If, if that's I mean, okay. when, when a pastor tells you, you should change the model a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> just, John, I mean, you want to ask one, and then let's get to Jonathan, and then we'll do it. Then yeah, we'll do it. Okay, yeah. just, I just, yes, I didn't want to move so quickly. I mean, that was so rich and deep. I don't want to move so quickly from yeah. this. No, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I, ha <clears throat> I have uh, spent a lot of time thinking about institutions. Um, over the last several years. And um, I, I guess I could just uh, make a comment and ask a question to set, the, to, to like set up other comments about this because I think you know, institutions have failed. The loss of trust is because of an actual, as you said, cascade of crisis, a massive series of failures. I think the way we fix it is by making institutions work again, um, which is easier said than done. And I was just thinking about, you know, <laughs> as we talk and think about this going forward, maybe we could try to really put some energy into thinking about what are the hallmarks um, and habits of successful institutions? How can we think about uh, starting new institutions and rebuilding old ones uh, in a way that is uh, built for the modern age? 
Um, I was mentioning to Jonathan before this that uh, there's something called the Bible Project, which is a, a website and an app <clears throat> that is te- reteaching uh, Christians uh, in, a, in around the world, really, how to read the Bible. And I've actually thought this before. I think it's kind of an example of a, of a more modern uh, institution because it's very digital, it has great video, a uh, great uh, app, um, and it's letting its work speak for itself. It's not courting controversy to try to build buzz. It's kind of building uh, organically and gradually and, and building uh, digital first products on top of a very, very, very strong foundation. And it's, I mean, I think it's transformative in terms of its potential impact. But I just think that overall question of uh, how do we build uh, uh, institutions uh, in a way that is built for the modern age, because there's so many incentive structures uh, that are that are cutting against uh, institutions. So how do we take all that into account and and uh, you know to quote Yuval Levin, uh, what's the name of his book? A time, time, to, time to, build. to build. You know, build again. So that's it. Please, Mona Charon. Bulwark. Thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Um, so, uh, great, great presentation. Um, and uh, I, I'm getting the feeling that you think virtue actually matters. Uh, <laughs> but look, uh, one of the things I think we can say about the institutions, about the institutions that have lost the most trust, is that they are the institutions that have, because of new technologies, become the most responsive to the vox populi. That's the media and government. So whereas, you know, and that's where we see the greatest decline of institutions. The the, the political parties have practically melted away because of social media, because of the availability of of, uh, the internet and direct fundraising and all of that. The political parties used to impose a certain kind of discipline on their members. That's fading away. And people, we have a much more direct democracy kind of uh, model in politics now than we used to have. And similarly, in my field in journalism, uh, you used to have a much more potent big institutional frame. right? The big newspapers, the big media companies uh, were gatekeepers and controlled what was done, what the moral and ethical standards were, need three sources, all of that has again been eroded by this much more direct democracy search for clicks and the fact that everybody is a pundit now and everybody can you know, have a huge audience. And so I think as we discuss this, it's worth sort of contemplating how we approach this, these problems of the decline of institutions because of the um, technological aspect of this and the fact that those that are closest to the people have tended to uh, you know, see a decline in their standards. Well, let me just add to that. I, I, I do think that the rise of social media has changed the landscape in exactly the way you're suggesting, Mona. Um, As a general proposition, it's unclear to me whether it's a net plus or a net minus. Uh, And I'd be curious about your view on that. Um, What we do know is that it's much easier to rise to the top and get recognition in today's world than it used to be. So, you know, AOC, came out of nowhere. You know, she left the bar and suddenly she was this national figure. That happened through sort of social media. That was sort of like what what allowed that to happen. But by the same token, once you get to the top, it is very, very hard to get change made, it, it, to, to lead and to actually get big things done because you're on a very slippery slope. The, the problem with rising so quickly is you can also fall very quickly. So people find one thing that's gone wrong or one indiscretion or uh, whatever the issue may be, your indiscretions get blown up and you slip off that, off that uh, pedestal very, very quickly. So it's, I think the j- jury is still out on whether we're going to look back upon this as a, a really important step forward in our democracy or whether it is increasingly seen as a step backwards as the Europeans are now 
increasingly arguing. But I'm curious about where you come out on that. If I had a magic wand, I'd yeah. eliminate all social media. <laughs> 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 Do one more from Laura Heim, and then we'll flip to Jonathan Walton. I have a question. Thank you so much for this presentation. When you speak to people all over the world, outside the United States, they followed very closely the American presidential elections, and you always have this question coming back, what will it take for the system to change the voting system in America? Right, with... Um, observing presidential elections yeah. from states of, of places abroad, what might it take to change the voting system structurally uh, in America such that the election cycle would be governed by we should We should hear from the New York Times editorial board. <laughs> <laughs> we got one out of two. Yeah. <laughs> All right, You're Reverend there. Jonathan Walton, let's flip to you, okay. um, and we'll come back to, um, to Michelle, hopefully, and others uh, soon, but uh, Jonathan, you're up. Well, Josh, thank you. Um, and. Uh, and thank you for tolerating me, even taking professorial privilege and re redirecting the conversation a little bit. But I was just so appreciative of uh, Brother David's remarks and the richness. And I saw the looks on all of your faces uh, that I didn't want to get in the middle of that. Uh, so I just wanted to give that moment of pause. Um, wow, I, I just have to say how much of a privilege and an honor it is for me to be here. Thank you, Josh, for inviting me. David, it's so great to be with you again. David Miller, great to see you. I was telling my wife, Cecily, who's here right there this morning, how, uh, or last night, how just, um, this was just such a great honor to sit around this table with all of you who I'm such big fans of and who inform me intellectually and inform me spiritually uh, every day with your incredible intellectual production. Um, it means so, so much to me. And, and the fact that you would even take time to sit here and listen, knowing that all of you probably have deadlines even right now and things that you could and should be working on. Uh, but this also speaks to the importance, Josh, of what we are talking about right now. Um, thinking about our roles as part of something bigger than ourselves. Right? Um, and, and what are even our institutional commitments? I have a question. Does anybody here know the name Benjamin Elijah Mays? Benjamin Elijah Mays. I think I saw two, two, two nods, two, three. Okay, that's about what I expected. <laughs> Benjamin Elijah Mays. Benjamin Elijah Mays was an educator, was a churchman. Was, historians describe him as the schoolmaster of the civil rights movement. He arguably is among the most influential figures of the 20th century as it relates to African-American education, but also the push for civil rights more broadly in American society. Came out of South Carolina, 96 South Carolina. Wanted to further his education headed to New England, graduated from Bates College in 1921 at the age of 27 years old. And after he graduated from Bates, he went to the University of Chicago, earned his PhD in sociology of religion from the University of Chicago. And then he spent the next until his 90s dedicated to institutions and institutional change, institutional reform, institutional expansion. Working in his early years with the YMCA on race relations. Became the dean of Howard University School of Divinity, right, training young clergy. Left the deanship of Howard University School of Divinity, became the longtime president of Morehouse College, shaped Morehouse College in what we understand it to be. And if you 
in terms of some of the most prominent figures in African-American politics, Maynard Jackson, African-American industry, African-American medicine, David Satcher, the arts, entertainment, Samuel Jackson, Spike Lee. So many people would point to many of them would testify most important figure in their formative years was Benjamin Elijah Mays. As well as a young preacher who came out of the city of Atlanta who didn't want to be like his father because he thought his father's religion was a little bit too fundamentalist for him. Young man born Michael, Michael King on Auburn Avenue. But it was at the age of 15 that he enrolled 1944 at Morehouse College. Enrolled at the age of 15. Why? Because Benjamin Elijah Mays had started a program because losing so many young men to World War II that, guess what? We can train African-American boys in high school. We can bring them here to Morehouse. They can get their GED and they can earn their college degree, this early admission program. So he took this young man at the age of 15 that they referred to as Mikey, Martin Luther King Jr. And Mikey, who entered wanting to be a lawyer, was transformed by Benjamin Elijah Mays, George Kelsey, tradition of theological liberalism that he was introduced to at Morehouse College, and a different way of being a preacher and a theologian because of Benjamin Mays. And most of the greatest lines and greatest quotes that we have from Martin Luther King Jr., when you read back through the writings, letters, and crown form speeches that happened every Thursday at Morehouse College, you'll see the indelible imprint, if not direct plagiarism, of which Sadie Mays used to get mad about. <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. quoting Benjamin Elijah Mays. Said Sadie and Benjamin, who didn't have children, Mays used to say he was like his son. King said that he's the, he's the father who had the intellect and the tenderness that I never had. So much so that when he was shot down on April 4th, 1968, today's anniversary of King's assassination. When he was shot down, who did he ask? Who did the family ask to give Martin Luther King Jr.'s eulogy? Benjamin Elijah Mays. One of the premier figures of the 20th century. Most of us have never heard of him. And I have a feeling right now Benjamin Elijah Mays is in heaven smiling. Because that's the way that he would have wanted because we may not know about Mays, but we know about the imprint that he made through the institutions that he built and the people that became moral architects and change agents because of it. So that's a real long introduction now to tell you a story. So I just happen to be, I'm a graduate of Morehouse College, right? Very much as a scholar, as a theologian, as a preacher, as now a dean of a divinity school, very much influenced by Benjamin Elijah Mays. Matter of fact, my oldest son is named Elijah Mays after Benjamin Elijah Mays. And so you can imagine the, at the 20th anniversary of my graduation from college, I was at Harvard at the time at the Memorial Church and I was honored with receiving the Benny Award, Benny. That's what it's called, the Benny Award, to distinguished alum of service. I was called back to Morehouse to this black tie affair gala to receive this award. My wife and I went, I put on my little tuxedo and I was there with honorees, another gentleman in my class, Theodore Colbert, who was is now it was I think at the time he was a CEO CEO of Boeing, um, and then the person winning the award in the arts was R and B superstar Usher. That's why my wife came along with us. 
Um, and uh, John Platt, CEO of, of uh, Sony Music, and Tyler Perry, uh, film guy. <laughs> Um, and so here I am with Usher, Tyler Perry, John Platt. We're being honored that weekend. I've come down from Atlanta to Harvard, from Harvard. I've come down and a young man walks up to me at the conclusion of the weekend after the black tie event. And he comes up and he says, uh, Professor Walton, I have a question for you. He said, I'm a religion major here at Morehouse College. I'm a senior, and I have a question. Can you tell me, how can I better expand my brand? How can I expand my brand? Chrissa. I asked the young man, I said, do you want to go into ministry? He said, yes. You're going to seminary next year? Yes. Do you feel a God's call on your life? Yes. And with all the righteous indignation I could muster, <laughs> I said, well, young man, you need to know the kingdom of God is not a brand. <laughs> And I buttoned my little tight tuxedo <laughs> and I paraded off with Usher somewhere. I use this story to point out a problematic and a dilemma. Because on the one hand, this young man asked me a question that I was giving a sincere, if not very considerate, generous, or thoughtful response to. And my sincere response is, I still stand by, the kingdom of God is not a brand. And part of the problem is that in all spheres of society, politics, education, religion, journalism, too many of us have been shaped by a culture of individual celebrity. Emphasis on individual flourishing, encouraging entrepreneurial impulse, expanding our individual brands. That is exactly what the culture has promoted for us. And that is what I was responding. But this young man, 20 years old, who has never known anything but this culture of entrepreneurial flourishing, this culture of when there aren't markets, we should create markets. The only thing that institutions are good for is promoting individual competition. Why? Because markets know best. Individual competition is what actually unleashes and exas uh, unleashes flourishing, brilliance, ingenuity, in innovation. And so it's this culture of competition that we've put such a premium on over the past 40, almost 50 years in American society, this young man doesn't know anything else. And so all he does is look on stage and he sees somebody sitting alongside Tyler Perry, Usher, myself, a beneficiary of meritocratic elite systems of which I have that I'm a personal beneficiary of, of which I represent. And then all of a sudden I get into all this supercilious moralistic finger wagging at him. And he's trapped in a world that we've bequeathed to him. Right. A world 
that Benny Mays would find so damn far. That is what, when we talk about the demise of institutions in American society, we also have to be honest. This goes for educational institutions, goes for politics, it goes for religious institutions. We have to be honest about the fact that this, that we as a society haven't been passive here. These aren't just developments that weren't in our control, but there has been an intentional dismantling and discrediting of institutions for the past 45 years at the highest levels throughout our various sectors. Often in the name of meritocracy. And what's interesting, this framework, this ideological framework, again, whether you call it neoliberalism, whether you call it meritocracy, this, neo, this framework, what's interesting about meritocracy, it was actually started, I mean, the term itself was, was a Michael Young, 1958, a set British satire, the rise of the meritocracy that predicted a society that where those children would be tested at a very early age and then they would be bracketed according to their intelligence. Why? Because the best and the brightest shall lead us. And that bracketing and that testing ended up leading to rigid educational tracking, rigid educational tracking ended up leading to concentration and consolidation of resources for some versus the many. And then that consolidation of resources ends up giving way to gross inequality in society, of which all structures and institutions that actually keep track of something, this thing we call the common good, are eradicated and disappear. And so right now in my world, communities of faith, we are facing this dilemma. We're facing a dilemma because we know that, for example, now for the first time in 50 years, people who identify as being religiously affiliated is less than 50%. Religious affiliation at an all time low, the rise of the nuns, nuns, N-O-N-E-S, that means non-affiliated, but non-affiliate does not necessarily mean not religious, but it's not affiliated. Why is that important? Because it says something about American religious identity. The turn from religion based out of the Latin word, Latin verb religare, to bind, to connect, that binds us stories, rituals, traditions, that bind us together in communities, that point us to ultimate values, ultimate concerns, something greater than ourselves. We've moved from religion to individual spirituality. We've moved from the language of faith to self-help and self-care. And now that has become the multi-billion dollar industry. So it's not that people aren't saying that they don't believe in the divine, that they don't have theistic conceptions, that they don't think that faith matters, but faith has taken this interior turn to the point that it's about self-individual fulfillment and flourishing. And so I'm more likely to attend a church and attend a conference about finding a mate or about starting a business than I am caring for the poor. Thinking about love, justice, tenderness. How do I expand my brand? Oscar Wilde 
Um, some of you may be familiar with this book. I picked it up not too long ago, read it again, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Tells the story of a beautiful young man that made a Faustian bargain, sold his soul to the devil in order to remain forever young and beautiful. And it's that Lucifer-like character, Lord Henry, in the text that Oscar Wilde says, he knew the price of everything, but the value of nothing. And as Dorian devolves into debauchery, his face stays the same, at least when he looks in the mirror, but when he looks at his portrait, it decays, it deteriorates. And I just have to believe, I'm just believing because of the wave we've put such emphasis on individual celebrity ethics, extents of integrity and its institutions that are formative spaces, they're functional spaces, they call us together. Like Brother Levin, my conservative brother who you cited earlier, right? He said, that's the problem. This is where I agree with him fully. He said, that's part of the problem. Instead of being formative spaces, our institutions have just become performative spaces. Congress, churches, education, they're institutions where we can perform our individual brands. But where I guess I would push back on Levin a little bit is to say, is what I'm trying to suggest to you now. Our hands aren't clean. And is this just an end result of a Faustian bargain that we made where we thought we could stay forever young by knowing the price of everything? And we don't know the value of anything. So I'll open it up to all of you right now. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, David. All right, let's start maybe with uh, Jackie Combs of the Los Angeles Times, based in DC. Um, thank you, both of you. I, I don't know that I really have a question. Your, your points made me think of several things. I try to be optimistic, but I fail. Um, and David, you bracketed your remarks by saying twice that people want to have hope. And yet in our politics or in our society, I see people gravitating, especially on the right, to messengers of negativism, of hate. Um, you asked, where are the heroes? And I thought, you know, I'm sure I could come up with number, but what instantly came to mind was someone like Alex Vindman, when you have someone like him who comes out, and in earlier times of my career would have been seen as a hero for speaking truth to power and putting his own career on the line for it. Um, you mentioned the role of corporations and CEOs and what they could do to help restore trust. And I repeatedly in the Trump years especially wondered, where are the CEOs? You know, you, you would occasionally come across some who would say that they did have fear for democracy, but there was never any concerted action like I've seen at other points in my career for other causes. And this seemed to me to be the greatest cause of all in my lifetime. Um, you asked about inspiring individuals to national service. And yet we're at a time where, you know, throughout all of our lives, people disparage the federal bureaucracy. And, you know, Ronald Reagan said the, um, I don't know how he described the nine words, but I'm from the government and I'm here to help. <laughs> um, but so we have one whole party or half of our society that disparages the deep state. There seems to be just a 
denigration of public service and national service that I'm not sure how we get back. Um, and uh, Jonathan, you, um, when you talk about the man who uh, wanted to know how to burnish his personal brand, I, I, I don't know how we get past that and you see it manifest so again, throughout our politics and society, that it's this sense of individualism over community that, just, that explains why, you know, um, COVID became so politicized and people wouldn't wear masks or get vaccinated. So in all of that, I guess I don't, I don't know what my question is. It's just like, it just seems like to each of the things you're both saying we need to do, the forces working against those are so great that I'm at a loss to know how to push back and restore, you know, to restore a sense of community, to restore, um, you know, to recognize heroes rather than immediately fall to your tribe's denigration of them. Anyway, again, I don't, I wish I had a harder question in that, but it's just, in part an observation and an expression of where my pe pessimism springs from. Well, I have a couple of questions from Jonathan. That was a very helpful inter uh, uh, intervention there. Um, Jonathan, one of the things that does, has given me hope for a long time is the quality that Morehouse and Spellman have come to represent and how, how unusual it is within, uh, within that community to turn out one good person after another. They're, they're, I don't know if it's in the water or it's in the culture, but something is going on there. And I, I'm curious what you think that is and whether it can be taken elsewhere beyond Atlanta. Yeah. Well, it's something, first of all, thank you. And it's something I think is in the culture. And that's why I was wanting to put and mark that kind of tradition of Benjamin Elijah Mays as shaping that over multiple generations, right? But we also understand that it's at risk and that it's under threat, yeah. right? Um, and it's a risk and it's under threat, particularly as the uh, quote unquote best and brightest, uh, and we define exemplary education not by what it produces, but by how many people we can keep out. Right. What do I mean by that? Those of you, the rankings of what are considered the top educational institutions right now, one of the biggest metrics for that is its admissions rate. Right. And the lower the admissions rate, the higher right, the ranking of the institution. Right over against the quality and caliber of people that it's producing, right? right? And that's, and again, that's something that points back and speaks to this whole kind of accentuation of the brand, right? Yeah. And carving out one's own place in a competitive market. Yeah. But if we're able to move from which these institutions do at their best, right? You mentioned Morehouse Spellman and I'm, keeping those institutions in my prayer, not only as an alum, but in the fall, we're, my Cecily and I are gonna have a daughter who's enrolling in Spelman as a freshman, right? Um, uh, but so it, it's very much about the values. But it, but it is about cultures of collaboration over yeah. competition, right? right. Um, yeah, when you walk on that campus, I've had that opportunity to do that. It's just, it's just different. It just sends you a message. This is a well put together a team. It's a well put together institution. and. Is there something we can learn from that for other institutions? Well, I can tell you one of the things that I heard so often when I was a student there, right? It was this African proverb. If you want to go far, I mean, if you want to go fast, go alone. Right. You want to go far, go together. Right. Right. And, and it's this based upon Mays, which, which King quotes in a letter from a Birmingham, yeah. J doesn't quote it, this is one of the areas he plagiarizes, uh, where he says, we're all inextricably linked by a common fabric of humanity and garment yeah. of destiny. Yeah. What affects one of us directly yeah. affects all of us indirectly. Yeah. And it's that sort of kind of common cause and common purpose, right? That is, that we have to protect from being undercut every day from market-based forces that are pushing us toward individual flourishing, yeah. right? Let me, let me ask you one last question for the moment. 
um, and that is the role of uh, religion and politics. Yeah. It's, it's worth remembering that up until about the mid-1970s, uh, the, the, the idea was among evangelicals, stay the hell out of politics. It, we, we've, you know, they've got their role, we've got our role. And then in 1976, as you'll remember, Jimmy Carter ran and ran intentionally to get a lot of the evangelical vote. He did, he succeeded, but they were very disappointed with his presidency. They didn't think they got from it what they were looking for. And that made them vulnerable to a Reagan appeal. And the Republicans came in and, and swept, you know, the evangelical vote went from being Democratic to being Republican very, very quickly. But it has also changed the evangelical movement dramatically and it's changed our, our politics. And what, how, how do you look upon that now and what we should be thinking about and doing? Yeah, I, I'd be in, interested in hearing what my brother Michael has to say about this too. But I would actually push back a little bit in terms of evangelicals and their relationship to politics pre the 1970s, right? Yeah. It was actually really, I mean, in many ways, and this was a strong critique of Reinhold Niebuhr throughout the 1950s. Part of the evangelical play was that if you are actually able to be perceived or become part of the quote unquote establishment as it relates to politics, right? That actually does more to concretize the status quo and preserve conservative positions. So the posture of we're staying out or we don't get involved is actually a political position, right? Mm -hmm. And it's a political position that actually protects one's preferred posture. Right. Yeah. And preferred yeah. outlook of the yeah. which for the foot which for which for conservative evangelicals, right. Right? right? So it worked to say that we don't get involved or we stay out of that, right? And so therefore, like for somebody like a Billy Graham, something like segregation, that's something that we don't get involved in because we understand that these are matters of the heart. Right. Right. Uh, that was a political posture that he was taking. Mm -hmm. Just as there was progressive evangelicals were pushing back. Right. That were saying to Billy Graham, like Dr. King did. Well, OK, well, guess what? Uh, the law might not change the heart. The law might not stop a white supremacist, might change a white supremacist's heart. But the law will start a stop a white supremacist from lynching me until his heart changes. Right. And that is that was that kind of dialectic tension within the evangelical communities that we see going back to the Civil War and, be, and before as it relates to abolitionists, evangelicals that were, that were constantly pressing versus uh, those of the Southern wing that took a conservative hands-off approach. Why? Because it maintained the unjust status quo. Well, I agree with uh, Jonathan. I always like to hear from our brother, Michael, so we'll see if we can get him in here. But let me just quick name the list after Mike. Uh, we got Krista Thompson, Will Salatin, uh, Adele Banks, and Miranda Kennedy. We'll see how far we can get. We'll have a coffee break uh, at 1030 firm, and then we'll come back. Mike, do you want to weigh in on this a little bit? Books. Yeah, I, I guess I would just strongly agree that evangelicals, say, in the 40s and 50s, were not apolitical. If you read the editorials in Christianity Today about the civil rights movement, they're just horrible. I mean, there was a positively bad role that they were playing. And they had decided in a couple of, of decades previous that their fights were going to be fights against modernity um, when it came to science or literary criticism or, um, you know, these kind of other fights that were not about, that didn't shape a kind of morally consistent um, framework but they were political in a certain way. Um, and, um, uh, and you do have to say, when, you know, I've, when I've been looking at this recently, um, with the first and second Great Awakenings, you had the pr production of this very powerful form of Christianity in American life. Um, a lot of Northerners um, took the route of abolition and social justice. Um, but a lot of Southerners almost immediately used the Bible as a way to justify slavery and segregation, eventually segregation. Um, 
And so those divisions were there very, very early. The thing that came out of the Second Great Awakening that no one expected necessarily was the growth of the African-American prophetic tradition. Um, and that is what ended up changing America. That's not identical to evangelicalism, but that's the people who changed the country. Um, and so you had these very political decisions being made for 100 years before <laughs> you know, 1970, um, the 1970s. Um, but, um, you know, to some extent, I think a lot of people are abandoning the term evangelical for that reason. Um, but it is a rich tradition that you can find elements in that inspire and, and um, challenge social convention in positive ways. Um, and um, so one of the reasons I continue to use it and very intentionally and qualify it as it relates to because there is this rich progressive strand in American history that has always challenged America to be as good as its promise. And this was these progressive evangelicals. Mm -hmm. This prophetic wing. Yeah. Thank you. Krista Thompson, Washington Post. Sure. David, Jonathan, thank you for your remarks. Um, I think it's given us a lot of chewy things to talk about. The question that I would throw back at you for more consideration is as you, you know, talk about preserving our institutions and the importance of institutions, can we also grapple with the need for the institutions to evolve? Oh, yes. When this young man comes to you asking about his brand, it is the culture that we live in. And I think we do, particularly amongst younger generations. I help to lead a newsroom that's 143 years old, and we have younger journalists who are pressing constantly for the institution to evolve. And I think part of the job is to, both with our traditionalists and those who, you know, and have some radical ideas about what journalism should be, to be in conversation with each other about what the future should indeed look like because our institutions are not perfect as they are. So I throw back at you the question of, you know, where should we be pushing to evolve our institutions to, to make them better and to grapple with the reality of what the culture currently is? I, I have to say, I mean, I just couldn't agree with you more on that, particularly in in relationship, say for example, if I were to speak about black churches, right? Black churches historically have been sanctuaries that have been for people who have been about freedom and liberation. At the same time, they've also been asylums for black folk who were scared to be free. Right? And the varying structures of domination and oppression that we see in their larger society have also taken root and have always been a part of these spaces that always that profess this language of liberation, right? particularly when we think about the misogyny, when we think about the exclusion of same gender loving brothers and sisters. Uh, this is uh, a mark of shame. And we know that our institutions, all of our institutions, again, whether we're talking about black churches, whether we're talking about the Southern Baptist Convention, whether we're talking about Catholic churches, they are shot through with hypocrisy, mendacity, all forms of duplicity. They absolutely are. And that's why we always need prophetic revivalist movements within our religious traditions to hold the institutions accountable. And so to your point about uh, helping this young man think about his brand, I don't think about that young man, but I can tell you, I think about the number of women historically that have found their voice and have carved out spaces over against the traditional, uh, the traditional levers of power and the traditional routes to hierarchy within the institution of black churches. And I'm glad that they have, because in the process, they've made our churches better, right? Because often they've had to find spaces, like Toni Morrison writes about in Beloved, in the clearing, women who were called, 
right, and who were anointed by God, though not affirmed by male hierarchies, have had to find spaces outside of the traditional spaces to exert pressure back, right? And so that is, I, I just couldn't agree with you more in that regard. And we have to be honest about that. We can, we can affirm our love for the institutions while, be honest, be self-critical. Let's do one more and then take a coffee break. Okay, so Will Salatin from The Bulwark. Uh, thank you, both of you. Um, I wanted to ask a question about, this is sort of prompted by um, David's comment about, you know, where are the Zelenskys? And it made me think, well, where was Zelensky himself? He was a comic actor, right? And uh, it, it's, so my question is, my question is about the role of evil manifest evil that everyone can see and agree on and, and what role that plays historically in the generation of what we're talking about, in the generation of trust, leadership, collective action, institution building. And, and I, this is not to take away from your very good points about what we must do regardless of the situation, but historically, was, is it not coincidental that we had great Building, a great building of trust after World War II. It was the war itself, it was the evil that we faced in the war and our mobilization against it that, that generated the momentum that David talks about. Uh, is that true uh, in the history of race in this country? Is it true of the abolitionist movement or the civil rights movement? Did we need to see a man murdered for 10 minutes to, to generate the, the collective, collective will and action um, around police violence. Um, it, I, I don't want to be pessimistic and say that evil is necessary, but historically, when you look at the emergence of leadership and collective action and institution building and trust, has that in fact been the thing that generated great movement? Yeah, I didn't quite understand. So effectively, does the existence of evil manifest in racism war and other uh, forms of, of perversity galvanize leadership in ways that are uh, instructive today? Well, <laughs> I, yeah, I think it's a, yeah, I, th I think it is a complex situ situation we find ourselves in that there have been, you know, strains of white supremacy that have been very powerful throughout our history. And sometimes they surface and frequently we don't talk about them. We try to hush, hush up the conversation uh, about them. You know, I just um, learned recently that I was astonished by with the GI Bill. I had no idea that the GI Bill basically didn't apply to blacks. I didn't realize that they were put on, put on the outside of that. You know, we celebrate the GI Bill as one of the great uh, contributions to trust and building the middle class uh, in this country. But we, we have not, I think, taken it upon ourselves to understand the deeper issues here. And what I sense right now with the whole 1619 project and the other things going on is that there's an unwillingness now to accept sort of standard ways of excusing what we do in our society, that there's, there is a real search for accountability now uh, and, that people, and that there's an anger level uh, um, and a, as well as exhaustion among a lot of people who felt that by now uh, we would have come much farther than we have. And it's, and that there is a, we, sim we simply aren't passing on to our children and our grandchildren a world that we should be proud of. And that, that I think is very uh, hard to take and we don't want to talk about it. But it's, it, but it's been interesting to me in recent, last two or three years that the uh, conversation among students has gotten much more, much rougher. And the anger is coming out and there's a lot of challenge. If you repeat the old ways, of, you know, but if you believe as I do, yes, we got a lot of problems, but we, we have the capacity to overcome most of these. We've done it in the past. There are a lot of black kids that don't believe that. They, they just think we're lying. Uh, and it's, 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 very, it's very tough to have good, a constructive conversation that you really think is enriching for everybody. And I, I'm not, I don't have the answers to that. I don't know quite what to do about it, but I do know it's getting worse, not better. 
John, what about the role of evil in galvanizing collective action? Well, the great theologian Ryan Holt Niebuhr said that there is only one empirically verifiable doctrine of the Christian church, and that's the doctrine of sin and evil. Right? That is what is empirically verified. That is what we can see. That is what's ubiquitous. And it's because of that that there's a certain embrace of the tragic, right? that in its best of the tradition, of its best, there's this embrace of the tragic that understands that evil and suffering is pervasive and that it will always be with us. And so therefore that's a very different, that's, and that's a very different take and view of the world than a kind of Pollyannish optimism. This kind of optimistic view that we see in many American Christian faith traditions. Things are gonna get better because they gotta get better, right? Or we love to get to Sunday. Right? We love to get to resurrect. I'm talking out of my Christian faith tradition. We love to get to resurrection since Sunday quickly without just sitting with the misery and depth of despair of crucifixion Friday. But it's an embrace of the tragic. It's an embrace of the despair that actually carves out possibilities, not for optimism, but of hope. Right. It's a good distinction between optimism right. and hope. It's an important distinction. It's an important distinction between optimism and hope, right? And hope is born of, listen, it may not be that things may not get better, but guess what? I still have a call I have. Right? I still have a call to serve. I still have a call to love. I still have a call. Why? Because those acts in themselves are redemptive. And that's not taking this kind of transactional approach with the divine. Right. We do this because of this. That's self-care, that's well-being. No, we do this because it's right, because it's just, because it's grounded in love. Yeah. All right, so uh, to resume, uh, we've got Adele Banks from RNS. We've got Carl Cannon uh, from Real Clear Politics. We've got Yair Rosenberg from The Atlantic and Dan Lippman from uh, Politico uh, and Michelle Cottle uh, from the Times Editorial Board. So Adele, you're up. Hello, thank you to both of you for your great uh, comments. Very helpful. It's very interesting to me how they kind of intersected with one another. Um, Jonathan Walton mentioned about nuns, the N-O-E and N-O-N-E-S-S, who are disaffiliated from congregations. And I'm wondering a lot in my continuing coverage of Religion News Service about how congregations deal with young people basically not wanting to be there and not interested in institutional religion. And then David Gergen, you mentioned the Civilian Conservation Corps. And for some reason, it made me think about Mormons and Southern Baptists and others who have like two-year commitments sometimes at the early, at, you know, when they're relatively young before they move into whatever they're gonna do with the rest of their lives. So I'm just wondering whether either of you think any of those kind of commitments might continue as hopefully pandemic levels go down, if the, the young people will do that kind of thing, or if there are other kinds of activities that would help reconnect uh, young people to congregations to really help them survive. Uh, you want to go ahead and respond? Please, yes, go ahead. Please, you <laughs> well, good question. I, I just learned over the break that BYU just had Amy Chu uh, come as a visitor, and she was a major advocate for national service, but made the argument that the Mormon church, you know, they send people out for two years, and it, uh, it has been a very, very successful program. It has broadened the, uh, the perspective of many people. I, I once read that one of the reasons that the Mormons are uh, so successful in Utah, it's like it's a land, it's a land surrounding, it's not a coastal city at all in, in Utah, but it's, it's one of the most prosperous parts of the country. And the reason is that they've had these Mormon young people go out and learn another language and they become globalists. And they then integrate in in an interesting way. So I, I, that, that's an element of the CCC I hadn't really appreciated, but I do think the whole point would be to get people to 
go work in an area they're not familiar with. It. If you're from rural America, you ought to go to the urban America. If you're in urban America, you ought to go out and see the rural parts of it. So it's good. It's a good question. I, I thought that Mormon experience was something worth uh, following up on. No, it's it's a really great question, and I mean, and and you added the COVID um, element to this conversation, which is just you know really a source of so much anxiety for so many congregations right now because there are just so many pastors and church leaders that just don't know what to do right now. I mean, the 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 language has changed because at least during the pandemic, as bad as that was, there was clear, do this, don't do this, and other, and also congregations just making sure that they were providing some sort of service. Now that we're in this kind of liminal space, um, many congregational leaders are, are just having to deal with the hard truths that a lot of people aren't coming back, right? People are just not returning. Um, though they are looking for other varying forms of engagement, right? And so uh, in some ways, uh, and I'd actually be interested to hear my dear brother and others speak about this. In some ways, one of the metaphors that uh, people are starting to use is the metaphor of the library to describe congregations, right? That is to say like libraries, li libraries that have done well and that have flourished in rec recent years are less about people coming through the turnstiles, right? And more about what they offer and what they're able to offer communities. And in the same sorts of ways, congregations, it's less about people coming inside of the doors in a, on a regularly scheduled programming, but in terms of what they offer to communities. And as it relates to young people, one of the things that we know that COVID has only exacerbated, David touched on this, the levels of anxiety, the higher rates of loneliness, the high rates of depression, right, that the pandemic have, has exacerbated. We also know that there's a correlation, direct correlation between that and the sort of disaffiliation, right, with varying community organizations and social buffers of which congregations are at the core. And so you have on the one hand, you have a, and this is the paradox that religious leaders find themselves in right now. Because according to market forces, well, attendance is down. Attendance is down, revenue is down, salaries are down, jobs are disappearing because there seems not to be a need. But of course, without the varying forms of affiliation and engagement, particularly for young people, loneliness up, anxiety, depression, and all of the varying things that are also leading to uh, 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 varying, even in some cases, deaths of despair, those are up, which need pastoral care interventions. Right? And so that's the, the double bind that so many religious leaders find themselves in with diminished resources while having to speak to increased needs. Uh, let's go next to Carl Cannon. And before we do, can I just softly nudge, um, maybe at the end of this conversation, Alan, if you have any thoughts, given your um, access to data about the nuns and affiliation and loneliness and mental health, these sort of survey um, uh, you know, measurable concepts, we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, and I got to think, Matt down. Lewis, before the end of the day, there's been a lot about you know, the self-made author and brand and that kind of thing. But yet in our industry, right, and I've heard you talk about this a lot, I've heard you talk about this with and you're Sullivan and Crouch and others. It's part of the industry. Like, would you just push back and get in on that a little bit before we wrap? So, uh, Carl Cannon. Uh, yes. Is my mic on? You bet. Jonathan, I have a question. Well, actually, for all three of you, actually. When I think of the rise of the nuns um, and taking a step back, I see two his big historic factors at play. One is, the first one was... Um, uh, and on both the Catholic and Protestant side of the Christian church, was the first was with this horrific, slow-moving scandal of um, clergy abuse of children, mainly in the Catholic church. Um, but once this was exposed, you know, pro sexual harassment in the Protestant church, the evangelicals, the Baptists have been dealing with this. The, the sexual misconduct by people of God, which is, and especially when it's aimed at children, sort of, the worst crime 
you could do. And I know numerous Catholic schools, have closed, the Catholic Church in the United States has paid out billions of dollars in damages. They've closed schools. I know many close friends who were Catholic who stopped going to church over this issue. And then the second issue is, and we've touched, touched on it, um, John Ward and, and Mike Gerson both mentioned, I mean, one of the reasons is lack of faith in institutions because these institutions have failed. And when I think about it's the involvement of the church directly in politics in ways that are off-putting to parishioners who go to church for a different reason. And on the mainstream Protestant side, I belong to two churches who've been divided over gay marriage um, and other issues. Um, and, you know, the evangelicals, the African-American churches, some of them are, you know, de facto Democratic Party precinct captains and and people notice this, and not everybody likes it. And on the and on the Republican side, the evangelical side, the conservative side, it's it's much worse. You have because of partisan politics, you have pastors basically advocating for guns. We're pro gun, which is an odd thing for a Christian person to even say if you think about it. Um, and these nuns, the, and they've told Alan's pollsters, they've told all the people when they hear evangelical or the word Christian, some of these young people. Many, millions of them, they hear opposition to gay marriage, which is an issue that simply doesn't compute with them. So you have these big historic forces. And I guess what I'm asking is, is there a way to reverse these trends and these perceptions? These, these people, the first group of nuns are now millennials. The second, the Zoomers are right behind them. These two generations, they're the, they're the largest. There are more of them than baby boomers. This is not a small problem for organized religion. And I guess my question is, is there a way to reverse so we reverse this damage that was done. Yeah. The, the, the sense of the power grab, the sense of particularly the evangelical power grab, and even how the term evangelical became a signifier for a conservative politics, right? The, the larger beginning in the 1970s, that was quite intentional. Right. I mean, that was quite an intentional. That was a discursive move. Some would even say that it was discursive violent, that violence that was done. That was one of the reasons that earlier when Michael said and I reaffirmed a kind of affirming another tradition out of evangelical politics, Martin Luther King Jr. was an evangelical, for example. Right. And so um, but it was part of this kind of power grab. Right. Um, and that that has actually ended up lending itself to the types of cultures that you talk about, people just being off put by it. At the same time, I don't want to overdetermine that as it relates to um, uh, that that is the cause in and of itself. Because the varying political forces and political winds and political affiliations around moral concerns is something that's always been a staple of American religion, right? And so if we only attribute this to the post quote unquote civil rights context, then we're ignoring the fact that the Methodist church, the Presbyterian church, the Baptist church in the early 19th century divided over the issue of slavery, right? As they circled their wagons around their varying approach to slavery or their views around women in ministry, right? Or in the mid 20th century around the issue of racial segregation and Jim Crow, right? Congregations being politically affiliated with or aligned with particular political positions has always kind of been a staple, right? So I just, I just say that, that I don't want to overdetermine that as the cause, right? And then I'll throw another reason in there. Another reason of, quote unquote, the rise of the nuns, right, that I think gets less coverage, but is actually somewhat of a positive development, is the rise of just religious diversity in American society, particularly since the Immigration Act, right? And so you have religious diversity in American society and you have actually the combinative cultures, including within individual families. So you have generations, particularly a lot of millennials who grew up whose, whose mother is Jewish and father was Catholic, right? Or whose mother is Buddhist and whose you know, father is not affiliated. And, and so that becomes another uh, reason why you have millennials who may not be, quote unquote, affiliated with one, 
But again, I think the thing that we have to begin to emphasize is the positive aspect of that. And the positive aspect is, is that people still have a robust sense of spirituality and a robust theistic concern. Right? And that there are ultimate values and there are ultimate concerns in this world. Our institutions just haven't done a good job of doing that. So the more our institutions then are able to look up from these varying culture wars that have seemingly captivated our attention and embraced all of our times and actually have a different sound. Uh, uh, there was a great preacher that used to talk about the sound of the trumpet. And if everybody is hearing the same sound, it doesn't matter, but somebody needs to, to, to play a different tune. If there's a different sound of the trumpet that can come along, that was Samuel DeWitt Proctor, right? Then I think that young people might have something to respond to, but it has to speak to their spirituality, their moral, their intellectual concerns about what we can do, not a, or what we're for versus to the point that you said, versus just emphasizing what we're against. Yeah, a couple of points. Alan, when you make a presentation on data, I'd, I'd be really curious about one thing. We know from a lot of uh, work that religiosity goes up when somebody gets married or they have a child. And with the number of people postponing marriage, postponing children, has that had an impact on the, on, on the rise of the nuns? Does that account for some of the rise of the nuns? I'm just curious about that. It's one, one of the leading fears. It's one of about a handful of leading fears. That's, in, that's, that's interesting, because that doesn't get a lot of attention. Uh, but I, I do want to come back to the um, uh, the rise of the nuns and the degree to which the abuses in the Catholic Church, but also the United Methodist Church, the Baptist Church, all of the churches have had problems. I think there's there's a role here for the media that's very constructive, and that is to hold the people to accountability. Uh, and you know, they going all the way back to the film about the Boston Globe, which was so successful. It was really you know this dogged pursuit of knowledge and of truth really can be helpful in getting people to clean up their acts. Uh, and, but at the same time, the question arises for the media, and I think, I think it's a really hard journalistic question, <clears throat> but uh, having now worked through sort of crises for several people who are friends of, of different kinds, how do you get, how does this, how do you clear your name when you've been falsely accused in one way or another you, and then it, it turns out you were, you were wrongly accused. How do you get the cloud to go away? Because that is a serious problem for a lot of people. You get caught up in this, um, you know, sort of, we, 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 and I think of the right, there's, how do you strike a balance between being responsible and not sort of sensationalizing it? Especially how do you avoid the sensationalization when the, when the, uh, the, Evidence is not clear, it's murky, and it's hard to resolve. And I can just tell you, going all the way back to cabinet officer, and I guess it was a Reagan administration, he was, he was you know, prosecuted or, or he failed to analyze to a, within an inch of his life. But when it was all over and it was shown that he was innocent, he had a good question. Where do I, know, where do I go to get my good name back? Where do I go to get my good name back? That is something I think that that the media really has a responsibility for trying to be very thoughtful about that. Uh, let's go to Yair next. And, and I'll just quickly add, you know, I think this is perhaps one area where horrific as these, you know, crimes uh, have been and are in the Catholic Church, SBC had its own issues, uh, lots of, you know, uh, we do read a, a different sort of timber uh, pace of, of headlines, right, than the, than the heartland, than people who are just going to church uh, and steadily going to church and not really thinking that much about these things. And so I think it's worth maybe remembering that even though, uh, just like with political journalism as well, like even though we, we, we move so fast and it's, it's, it's Twitter feeds, there are a lot of people, maybe it's 80 or 85 million evangelicals, uh, who many of whom are just sort of uh, less mindful of these um, uh, coastal elite dynamics, and they're just going to church. So there's a, there's a little piece there to keep in mind as well, Yair. Well, I, I just really appreciated that David just set up my question so nicely, um, which is very politely saying that maybe journalists themselves have uh, some institutional cleanup to do. 
Um, because I, what I thought I really liked about your presentation is together they were kind of complementary and that David talked about the erosion of, of trust in institutions. And then Jonathan pointed out it, it's not just the weather. It's not a thing that just happened to the institutions. Um, it wasn't just done to them. It's something they were complicit in. Um, and, you know, it's easy to talk about that when I come about other institutions, but the way you're going to fix it or address something is always in your own backyard. And that's for all of us is journalism. And, uh, the question I want to throw out to the room, and I think a lot of us are thinking about is, what are things that actually the journalism industry could do to demonstrate uh, that they want to regain trust, could to gain more, to regain certain trust? Now, obviously, there are outside forces that we don't control that spend all of their time trying to discredit what we do. Um, and you can make a whole huge list, and all of those things are true, but it also is true that there are things that we have control over, and those things do affect how we're perceived and whether we're trusted. And when you pose like, how does somebody clear their name after a tremendous number of scandal stories, and then it turns out it's not so, but who hears that other part of the story, right? How we cover that kind of story. That's one of many examples of questions that could be posed. And something I think about a lot, what could newsrooms do? What could journalists do? How, does, I, how do I as a journalist show my readers that I'm accountable, right? And that I, and how do I earn their trust and how do I hold that trust? And I feel like that's the most important thing that we can have as a journalist. Um, how do we, how do we build that? And I'm, I'm saying it to the room, but also to the people on the panel who don't work in journalism. And sometimes the people from the outside can see things that those on the inside can't see. So I'm kind of curious what you think. I mean, th thank you for asking that question. I, re I really, really are glad you asked that question. I mean, you pose it that way. Uh, when I was talking about the kind of, you know, having a larger social vision and the role that all of you play in that, right? I so appreciate, I have to say, I so appreciate the ways that your guild, your field holds my guild accountable, right? The work that you've done, say, for example, on whether it's the Catholic Church, particularly the work the Washington Post has done on Southern Baptist Convention and the New York Times, right? Exposing the kind of mendacity and hypocrisy, that is absolutely so important. And I get teary-eyed when I also see pieces, right? Um, in the Atlantic or the New York Times and others about the daily quotidian rhythms of people just trying to live right and love right with their God and their neighbors and in their communities, right? <clears throat> like the people that you said that, hey, they aren't thinking about some of these larger political dynamics, right? They aren't thinking about some of these larger cultural wars. They are trying to figure out how do I remain in community during this pandemic? How do I actually have my children part of weekly rituals, right? That are, that are important meaning making for them as a family that allow themselves, that makes sense to them, right? And it's the smells, it's the tender touches, it's the actions and activities that you're able to capture of everyday people, right? That I think Rem helps us and helps us remind us all of the ways in which we need each other. Okay? And I started off with this language of social vision. And it's actually, she's not here. I, I love the way that, uh, uh, is it Mary Gay? Uh, wow. if it, she's coming. She's in the air. At the New York Times. I love the way that she, when she talks about New York, the way she talks about people who had a social vision the way that they thought about the rail system, the way they thought about libraries, the way um, that they thought about parks, the way that they thought about community, right? It was in relationship to one another. Right? And that is where I think those types of stories, particularly from a religious perspective, I think that that helps. It, it engenders the type of hope that we talked about earlier in the face of what we know to be the ubiquitous nature of evil. Daniel Littman from Politico. Uh, thank you so much, both of you. Um, I had a question for Jonathan. So you talked about the meritocracy and some of the problems with it. What about if we, if that was de-emphasized a lot, 
wouldn't there be a risk that people like Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or countless people in uh, other fields would not be able to rise to the same extent and that our American competitiveness and the, uh, you know, how big the American economy is and how we create so many innovations that there would be less incentivized for, uh, you know, incentives for that and that you would see fewer of those people uh, want to become famous and to contribute to society and to do that type of work or we or is that just going to always be ingrained of that American individualistic uh, DNA? Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I think since de Tocqueville, right, on democracy, de Tocqueville talked about kind of American individual, you know, this kind of strand of American individuality, right, and this emphasis on the individual that's always been a feature of American society. So I, I don't think that that's going anywhere. But I think the kind of unbridled individualism that now gets cloaked under this language of meritocracy in such a way that the prominent narrative is the one that you just provided. Right? And what we hear so much less about is something like we talked about in my, in my world in education. Right? The fact that if you take Princeton, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Right, that have less than 5% admission rates, but there are more students at those institutions from the top 1% income distribution than the bottom 60% put together. Right. That, is that meritocracy? Is that what we're talking about here? Or if we talk about something like, I mean, now I know that we can shift away from it a little bit, you know, standardized testing, you know, particularly as a result of the pandemic, and hopefully we might not be going back to that. Right? But if we're talking about if you're from a household of two hundred thousand dollars, right, which makes more, uh, which uh, on average scores two hundred and fifty points more than somebody from a household of sixty to eighty thousand, right? Like that's what we're talking about, and it's and 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 so the beginning to think outside of this kind of framework. Right. Where we understand that meritocracy, as it's been deployed, has been a kind of a catch all phrase to promote innovation, to promote, you know, to move away from kind of heredity based uh, in the mid 20th century, heredity based leadership. And it maybe was a good thing. But now we have to see the fruits of where we are and we have to be honest and self-critical about that. Got a couple more people on the list, but I wonder, I just David. A yeah, please. Follow up. Um, the and I'd love to hear your thoughts, David, too. The um, and this is kind of a small point, but if you got rid of or you de-emphasize a lot of like the gifted programs, the, the tracking, and all that, uh, that's in public schools. Would you see a flight of lots of these very smart kids to private schools by their parents, or they're like, and wouldn't that create a cost on society at all, or? Well, I'm saying I think we've already seen that. Yeah. I mean, we've already seen that, right? Whether it's we're talking about the the kind of flight to independent schools and private schools. I mean, we we already see that. Or whether we're talking about the top funded public schools, like say a Stuyvesant in New York, right? We've already seen in terms of the access to get to those schools and who gets the access, right? So those dynamics. I mean, that that horse has already left the barn. Right. So if anything, now it's a matter of how we're able to d democratize right, these privileges that right now are at the hands of a, a very concentrated elite. Yeah. And so the, the real division in American society, I mean, we often talk about we love particularly people in the political world love to put the emphasis on the middle class, right? The middle class, middle class, middle class and the poor. Right now, the biggest divide in American society isn't between the middle class and the poor. Right. Actually, the rich outpace the middle class more than 25 times than that of the poor, right? So it's really between the rich and everybody else. Right? Yeah. I, I remember being a student, you know, in David's class, and there was this great line. I don't remember if it was from you or somebody else, but it was that you're always speaking over at the Harvard Business School. You're getting all over the, 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 uh, the university. But the line was, uh, remember, if you go over to HBS, two-thirds of HBS is BS. At least it's matter. What, what else? Good Good. Well, I, I, I want to come back to this because I, I don't think the case is as clear cut 
about education as it should be. I, I simply don't understand why, in a, in a, when we're all committed to improving the quality of education, when the black, when, when the people in the black community or in the communities uh, want to put their kids into really good schools, they want to put them into charter schools, they were outperforming other schools. You've had volunteers coming in from Teach for America. I was on the board for Teach for America for a long time and been very involved with city here. Um, and we're in a situation where, where the left is trying to close down charter schools. And just and what we know is that charter schools are actually pretty darn successful. And that a lot of black families are trying like hell to get their kids into charter schools. And I just do not understand why we, we have continuing politics uh, about issues like this that I think are holding back kids. The, um, the KIPP schools are run by uh, Wendy Kopp's uh, mm -hmm. husband. He told me that for every $3 that KIPP schools spend on education, they have to spend $1 on politics to get the right people elected to protect themselves in order to build a charter school system. And the KIPP schools have been very, very successful. Help me understand why this is so difficult. And when, when there is a strong case for having teachers come in, they're not having the unions completely dominate uh, the question of how do we get good, good education for kids? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just curious about that. Uh, but I think in response to what Daniel's question was, I guess I would say that these to me are side debates. Right. When I say side debates, I'm talking about. So in other words, it becomes charter schools versus public schools. Right? Charter schools are public schools. No, no, no. I'm saying but I'm talking yeah. about in terms of the resources and the resource yeah. distribution yeah. Right, right. of them. Right? right. And so so often the debate becomes one of, yeah. oh, well, if we invest in the charter schools, then we're diminishing yeah. and we're taking away from and we're taking away from public schools. Right. right. Like that's right. often right. the argument. Right. right. And, and I'm saying like that's a that's a red herring argument. Mm -hmm. Right. That's a red heading argument where all the attention gets there, right? But what are we seeing? What we're actually seeing is not between A, because largely now we're talking about <laughs> poor and working class and middle class folk, right? Mm -hmm. But we're talking about the kind of unraveling of society where there is a critical concentrated mass of people that aren't even in debate in that, that are being provided the best resources and are, and are having the best, best access, right? Yeah. And so it's this kind of fighting over this small piece of the pie, right? That I think if we keep our attention there, we're missing a much bigger, much bigger debate. And I think that the logics of this kind of meritocracy, that was at the heart of Daniel's question. Yeah. This logics of meritocracy, beginning to think through that begins to help us reframe <coughs> the debate. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Let's go next to Malika Bilal. Thank you. Of what you had to say. My question is for you, David, but Jonathan, feel free to um, chime in. And it is um, about the uh, spy plane debacle you mentioned with Eisenhower. And I just found it striking that you said, you know, after he lied to the public, he felt like it was a calamity because he felt like he was supposed to tell the truth. Now, someone who's advised several presidents. Um, I wonder where that went. And I say this as perhaps a black person, a Muslim person, a cynical journalist person who just expects my leaders to lie to me. Um, and so that's not a thing that I would ever. You, you expect them to lie to you. Yeah, I don't want that, but I expect yeah. it. With, good, um, and so with good reason, with ample it, reason. Exactly, because it happens a time and time yeah. again. And first rule yeah. in journalism yeah. school that I remember is if your mother says she loves you, check it out. So that's my nature, but I do wonder in terms of that level of, of mistrust that the public has in an institution, the presidency, where that went, where the, the, the feeling that this is a calamity that I've lied to the people has gone. Yeah, well, I, I do think it was very valuable for the Washington Post to keep count of Donald Trump's mis, mis lies and uh, misconceptions. And you know, I think he basically uh, was very dangerous for a democracy uh, and it hasn't gone away yet. I mean, this is still a very live possibility that he could become president. A bigger possibility, I think, than many people think. But, uh, but it is, I think, the contrast between Eisenhower being so mortified that he had lied or was caught out or had lied, I guess it was a better place to, to the fact that we're all numb to the idea that a president can lie 3,000 times in a single week. 
and we just sort of go on about it and we don't think about it. And now, <clears throat> I think the greatest danger, of course, is the, uh, the onset of all this disinformation. Nobody knows what to believe anymore. And I do think that it contributes to the exhaustion and the, the, the sense of people saying, well, I just don't understand. I don't want to talk about it. We've heard about June 6th and for the last month and a half, and let's go on to other things. Uh, it is a, uh, we've come a long way and it's mostly downward on the question of, of truth. I, I do think there have been some people, uh, like a John McCain, uh, you had to, I respected him a lot because I did think he was a straight shooter. Uh, and you know, when he was in trouble, he went and said so and so forth. There are some people who set the standards that you have to sort of look at and say, that's really impressive. But they're, they're not as many as there once were. It was once taken as a given that you didn't lie. When I first got into politics, it, you know, there were standards on that. And uh, they, they, the truth in some White Houses of recent note, the truth, what's considered true, is what you can tell the public that they'll believe. You may tell them three different things, waiting to see which, which belief you know, strikes home. Okay, that's the truth. And it, beca it becomes, a, we're in this sort of nightmarish world where we really don't know from one day to the next who's lying and who's not. And uh, I mean, it's just where we are, and I, but I don't, and I, I, don't, I don't have the answers for it, but I think, I think that goes to cultural points. I think it has a lot to do with when you, you graduate from Morehouse to Spelman, for example, you're known to be or you're thought to be a person who doesn't lie, a person who sort of upholds the, the, the truth, a person who is very respectful, a person who listens to others. Those things are taught. And they, they, people come out of a culture and, and Morehouse and Spelman in which they have a high degree of reliability because that's been in their culture. And it makes a huge difference. And the cultural, these cultural questions, how do you change our culture? And I think it means, I think it is all about how do you get, try to raise the standards for the people who are entering who are, who are becoming our leaders of tomorrow and preparing them for that, for a more noble sense of what their purpose is. Hey, I, I really appreciate your, I mean, I just appreciate your, your moral commitments, David. And then I find myself sitting here thinking like, and it is kind of for everybody, like, I've, like the difference between those who lie and, you know, so therefore honesty, you know, honesty or dishonesty being, you know, having moral weight, right? So the difference between those who lie and those who are just sincerely yeah. wrong. Yeah, yeah. Right? You know, like how do we distinguish yeah. between, right? Because yeah. like when I think about people in, yeah. say, the world of, you know, religious faith, right? The, those who would stand and yeah. would say that women aren't fit for this. Yeah. Or, and I think about people, you know, people of color aren't fit for this, right? Yeah. They thought they were speaking from honesty and sincerity, yeah. and they're just wrong, right? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I, I do have a, a sense that uh, the people who occupy the high ground, the moral high ground in our public discourse today are increasingly black women, women of color. Because they had their, 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 the experiences they've had, the discrimination they've faced, and the fact that they're now willing to come out and do, you know, undertake these reforms and push for it, it's, it's uh, really, I think, uh, encouraging and admirable. Uh, and I wish we could spread it to others. But my, my content, not, and not in every case, obviously, but as a general proposition, it was like for a long time, you know, the Israelis occupied that moral high ground in the Middle East. They've slipped off that for a variety of reasons. But for a long time, it really distinguished the Israelis as a people. And I, we have slipped off too. And, how, and whether we can get it back or not, I think it has, will have a huge impact on our leadership in the world. Yeah. Listen, if you don't mind me saying, y'all know I like a story, right? I love a good story. You just gave me the opportunity for a good story. All right, Benjamin Elijah Mays, we had two in here. Joanne Robinson, that name struck a bell with anybody? Joanne Robinson? Got, got one. Mary Fair Burks. All right. We talk about, you, t you just said that, you know, black women 
are like at the increasingly at the forefront. Like I'm one who loves to make the argument any opportunity I can that black women have always been right, at the kind of moral forefront and always been the kind of you know moral leaders. I mean, when Martin Luther King Jr. shows up to Montgomery, Alabama, it is Joanne Robinson, it is Mary Fair Burks, two women, English professors, Alabama State University, that has started the Montgomery Women's Improvement Association that was fighting for anti-discrimination and segregation on the buses, right? that was fighting for voter registration, that was fighting against sexual assault at the hands of both white and black men, fighting against that in town. And it was these women who actually took and shaped a young Martin Luther King Jr., right? And so, we, so it's easy today when we say things like, well, where's our Martin Luther King Jr., right? You know, we're looking for that kind of one symbol of leadership, right? But really, historically, when we think about who the true leaders were in that community, King was a symbol. But these women, like Joanne Robinson and Mayor Fair Burks were the, and so many others, were the leaders who were doing the ground game, right? And who were, through their institutions, shaping the moral character of next generation. So, yeah. That's good. Uh, let's maybe jump next to Michelle Cottle, New York Times. Okay, so David has me thinking about a second question as well, which is in the case of people lying to us, what we expect from our leaders. How much of that do you think is attributable to kind of our expectations changing? I mean, for example, JFK's health, he lied about all the time, and his personal life was appalling. But back then, it was considered a zone of privacy, and he was protected by, you know, to some degree, the press that covered him. But you could never get away with that today. Uh, there is no aspect of a politician's life that is considered out of bounds. So it seems like there's at least a little bit of different expectations and cultural mores at play. Um, so that's one. And then another one is you had mentioned you talk to young people and they're angrier. You're, you're feeling they're angrier and they're frustrated that the system has failed them. Do they have a sense of what is a potentially better path forward. And as an example, you know, Gen Xers, we used to be told, didn't like government, but they were up for activism and volunteerism. Are you seeing kind of a next generation that has some ideas about how they would want to approach things differently, or are they just, just so frustrated that that's not at play? Oh, I, <coughs> I, I, see, I think we see tons of young people who have are innovative in their thinking, especially the social entrepreneurs, you know, who've come into the nonprofit space. Uh, and they started by, in many cases, feeling that they, they were filling a hole left by government, government failures, say, in education. And, and they, they were coming in to sort of repair the bre re breach, if you would. Um, th they've changed their mind on that now. They no longer see the government as they're sort of the alien, but they, they realize to, for the most part that they need government. They need government as a partner because you can't go, you can't scale up very easily. It's so, so hard. You know, it's easy to start an organization. It's really hard to build it uh, up, you know, to hit a $300 million level, for example, is really, really hard. But there's a lot of innovation um, and people who want to get in and, you know, they, just as, as innovation is respected in Silicon Valley so much, it is the, the, the nonprofit world. There, there are just a ton of organizations in which there are more volunteers than, than there are spaces. Uh, and there, there's a real question of how do you expand that? National service would do that. One of the, the idea behind national service is you pump more money into community organizations. You don't do it at the federal level. Rather, you support things almost as or you get a grant if you you prove that you're worthy of it because you you know you, it's like a, it's like getting mezzanine funding when you're uh, uh, in that field. And um, I, I think there is a. I, I see with these veterans coming back, and military veterans, you and I have spoken about this, coming back from Afghanistan and, and, and uh, Iraq, they are so hot to try to rebuild the country. 
they remind me so much of the World War II generation. They are, they're, they're very enthusiastic about it. They will stop at nothing. There are a growing number of people. I'm involved in trying to get more veterans to run for office. We've, we've got a pretty good stream now going into the, uh, to, to the House of Representatives. And the quality of some of the people there who are veterans, several of them women, uh, is uh, changing things in the House of Representatives. There, there's a more centrist group that's now emerging, people who work across the aisle. It's, it's very small, uh, but it's very active uh, and uh, is, I think, doing some really, really interesting work, getting it done. So, yeah, I don't think the, I think having people with an innovative, enterprising spirit is not a problem. I, I think having people who uh, really care is not a problem. They, they, what they, a lot of them don't want to go work in a corporate life anymore because they don't, they think it's so compromised. Uh, and so they, that appeals to them to come into the nonprofit world. Um, but as I say, I, we just don't have enough places for them at this point. The Peace Corps has faced that problem for a long time. You know, that the number of applications is much greater. And th the nonprofit field too is where you can get some of these gaps closed. You know, the, uh, right now I'm on, I'm on a board because somebody called a, a new, uh, new profit. And we're trying very, very hard. So we, we support a lot of different nonprofit organizations. Our aim right now is to get to 50% of all of the organizations we support are going to be led by people of color. We already got the number of women up, but to get, to get people of color in that position is, uh, is really, really important. And I think, the, and it's where, you know, as in the Second World War, when you had a salt and stall who was, re, who was saluting some Polish kid from Brooklyn, that democratized our country. And, and I do think that getting people to serve in their communities, whether it be under the banner of uh, national service or not, to getting people to serve in their communities, I think helps to close some of those gaps. We have an incoming speaker next time, Ibu Patel. Yeah, Ibu is a, good, is a friend. Yeah. Yeah. Ibu Patel yeah. is a, a walking example of someone who's doing terrific work. He's a Muslim out in Chicago, and he's been, has, has, has he come in to speak this time? Yeah, the next, next forum in, yeah. in Napa. In, he's in great. June. He's yeah. really, really good. I mean, I, I want to just raise one for Matt, um, because I think this top topic of, uh, look, right, I, I recognize right now that there is a camera in the back of the room, and it affects the way I act and perform. I'm and glad it cleans up your act. It, it helps. <laughs> uh, it'd be better if we were wearing flip-flops down by the beach, but we're doing it in front of a camera. And there's a lot of chatter about this right now, right? That like cameras ought to get done away with in the, in the Congress because people would, would perform less and they would actually work together. And, um, and there's been talk of social media maybe being completely abolished. That would help. Uh, or uh, there's been talk about building our brand. Can we build my brand? Can you help me with that? And I'm curious... Uh, about how to interact with that honestly as a journalism uh, journalist. Uh, Matt, you've been in the industry for a while now, and you're part of our advisory council. And, you know, it's one thing to say that we should use Twitter less, but a lot of us have to use Twitter for our work. Uh, so how does that fit into uh, the, the calls for healthy reform? Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Or do I need to? Yeah. yeah. So, um, well, I guess this was a great, a great discussion, and... Um, I mean, I just, I agree if anybody came up to me and their lead was my brand, <laughs> that would be, I'd be a little concerned about them and I don't think we should lead with the brand. And I also agree, uh, talking about uh, Benjamin Elijah Mays, that we need people who are not seeking the limelight, at least primarily, that, that, that are, whatever your cause is or the movement, there should be a lot of people who are um, primarily there to mentor or to be intellectual leaders without running to have a brand. Um, but by the same token, Dr. King did have a brand. And, and I think the term you used effectively was used the media. Yeah, you yes. said symbol, but it's basically a brand. And, and I think his enemies or adversaries would have liked to have eroded that brand. And he was very effective at... I'll use the term marketing, um, marketing his ideas, which were, I think, noble, but they were meant to persuade. Um, and now we have the example of, of Zelensky, who is an actor. And uh, I believe that, you know, his primary, uh, the, thing that, the thing that we like about him primarily is 
the, the substance of his message. However, I don't think we could discount the fact that he is a good messenger. He has built a brand right now um, and he's incorporating marketing techniques and, and showmanship even to, to persuade and to advance that brand and that message. And I think his motives are pure in my opinion and that, that's key. And this, uh, this comes to, I think, um, the challenge is like being in, being in this world, but not of, but not of this world. Um, and I, again, I think it's, it's, I agree with the, the, the danger of the trend where everybody at all times, their primary goal is to be the star, to kind of be a rock star and to be a brand. But I think that what makes uh, this really hard is that um, you have to simultaneously have a purpose and have the right motives and focus on ideas and change. But you also have to be in this world, cultivating to a certain degree a brand. Uh, maybe it's a Twitter following. And those two things, that tension is constantly at odds. And, and uh, so I, I guess my question, I would ask Jonathan, my question is, um, do, do you agree with, with that, that, that even though the brand part and the marketing should not be the number one goal, um, that you still, a movement has to, somebody has to be focused on um, building an image and, and marketing techniques. This is where I think the this is where I think the role of institutions can come in, right? Because if we have institutions that can keep us grounded and can hold us accountable to a larger vision and to a larger goal, right? I believe that then that frees up the space to allow some to do exactly what you're describing. I mean, that was king. Right. That was King. King, in terms of he knew how to effectively use the media. He knew effectively how to use television cameras, whether it was in Albany, which he did, wasn't as successful, or Birmingham, where he was very successful. Right. Because he was able to pique the nation's attention. Right. Uh, by getting into their their living rooms. Right. And seeing the sort of torture and terror that people of color lived up under every single day. Right? And there are people, particularly those of you in this room, that are able to do that so effectively, right? And I would never want to besmirch that. At the same time, he was also part of a larger institutions that, including those Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, Southern Christian Leadership Coalition, NAACP, many of which were often coming at him, critiquing him. Students called him the Lord facetiously, right? Because of the fact that they thought that he was always preening in front of the camera, right? And so young people were holding him accountable, right? Ella Baker, uh, the Southern Leadership, I mean, Southern Christian Leadership Coalition was holding him accountable to his kind of misogynistic, uh, 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 autocratic tendencies and ways born of his Baptist church right but that's where having these others right as part of healthy robust institutions i think makes all of us better and i guess that's what i was suggesting right yeah. that when we move away from and we discount the institution and we only privilege the individual then we aren't going to have we aren't going to have movements we're just going to have moments yeah I, I, Jonathan brought up Ella Baker. She's another name people don't know very well, but it was extremely important. But what I found in very interesting about her tie to the today is there's an experiment going underway now in the, the black movement, especially Occupy Wall Street and BLM, uh, in which there's a view that the old way of having a leader at the top should give way to a new, a new uh, way of approaching this. Ella Baker believed very strongly that you build at the local level, you build at the community level, and you build from the back ground up. And we don't want just one or two leaders out there, because by the way, one of them could easily shot. Uh, and, and we want to have a different structure. And they're call, some people are calling it leader less. And the, another person's calling it, no, it's leader full. Uh, but, the, but the whole idea is, is to move away from the notion of having king or having X alone and try, and try to have a more balanced thing where you've got a lot of people at the bottom who are not recognized necessarily. They don't get a lot of attention. They don't have a narrative and they certainly don't have a brand, but they make huge contributions. 
And I, and I, I just found she, I mean, she went off to form SNCC because she felt it was a, would, would provide a different kind of, and, you know, uh, uh, John Lewis went with her to see if they could provide this different kind of leadership. Strong people don't need strong leaders, she used to say. Uh-huh. Used to say. Uh, that's really rich. I wonder if we could turn to Alan uh, Cooperman for a, <coughs> any closing reflections, you know, disaffiliation, decline in institutional attachment, uh, nuns, uh, mental health dynamics and COVID. How do, how do you see that? David, this is like our keeping them honest at the end of the, right? This, uh, <laughs> no, I'm going to... Uh, testing all of our facts that we've wrong. thrown out yeah. here. No, right? I, gets to, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll try. I'll make a couple of uh, marginal, probably not insightful comments about measurement, how some of these things are measured. And then um, I'd like to throw it back. I have a question for, for each. I think it's been fantastic. And uh, everything I'm going to say is just to reinforce the points you've made. Uh, David, you talked about trust, and uh, you talked about trust in institutions in particular. Um, And you talked some about trust in political leaders. Uh, There's a third way that trust is often measured, and that's sort of general social trust. Uh, In general social trust. And uh, it's classically asked in a polling question that goes something like this. And I, I've always found this question amusing. I, I hope you all like this. I don't know who invented this, um, but it goes like this. Uh, can people generally be trusted or can't you be careful enough? And that's the way the question's often asked. And uh, all three of these things, trust in political leaders, uh, trust in institutions, and generalized social trust, they've all been declining for some time. David, you mentioned, uh, you said there were three institutions uh, in which uh, institutional trust have remained pretty high and and fairly stable, and you got two of them, military and small business, and you couldn't remember the third. I believe the third is science and scientists. At least that's in our poll. Yeah, scientists. Yeah. Yeah, that's one I was missing. Yeah. Uh, And then, um, you know, generally, um, all of these are down. Uh, Some are down more than others, uh, but I think a really interesting uh, factor that we haven't talked about very much is uh, which of them have become more politically polarized. So trust in media, trust in the Supreme Court, uh, and trust in higher education most recently are the ones that have become most deeply polarized and were not so deeply polarized that long ago. Um, then uh, uh, Reverend Walton Jonathan um, talked some about uh, the rise of the nuns and, and also talked about indirectly um, congregational membership. So what's actually fallen below 50% is congregational membership. Uh, the share of Americans who say they belong to a congregation. That's a little bit different from affiliation, which is do you have a religion and what is your religion? It's also down, but it's still up pretty high. It's, it's still around 70% of Americans who identify with a religion, and it's above 60% as, as Christians. So it's about 64% Christian in our polling. Depending on how you answer the question, you get find somewhat different numbers. Interesting thing is that... Uh, Oh, and also you mentioned just briefly a little bit measures of religiosity, like church going, do you go, do you believe, et cetera. All these things are down. And though a few institutions have remained high, social trust is down, trust in government in general is at an all-time low for all the period that it's been measured in, in sort of modern, modern polling. Um, I think what's kind of interesting, though, is that... Um, there's a tendency because all our lives we've seen all these things go down to think they've always been going down and that some, it's like all of history has been a decline or all of American history has been a decline in all of these things. And I don't think that's the case. Uh, of course, we haven't had modern polling since like the 1940s or 50s. And, and so there wasn't measurements of trust going back before, say, 1940. Uh, on the religion side, though, we do have measures, and and historians of religion have looked into this, and congregational membership rose fairly steadily in the United States for nearly 200 years, um, and and reached a peak sometime in the 1960s or 70s at around two thirds of Americans who b- said they belonged to a religious congregation, uh, and as we now know, it has 
since dropped fairly steadily since the mid 1970s to below 50%. Now, um, I think the, the question I wanna ask for David is about polarization. And if you'd comment on polarization and its role in declining trust, why these particular areas or anything you wanna say about polarization. And Reverend Walton, what I'd like to ask you about is what allowed the rise of these institutions in the first place? Why did congregational membership rise all those decades and decades? It rose all through the 20th century uh, until it peaked again sometime in the 60s or probably the 1970s, and since then it's been declining. Um, and I, in particular, I wonder about the relationship with economics. And I think you did touch on this. Uh, both of you touched on economics. By the way, David, at the end of your conversation, said, said your, your remarks, said something really interesting. Social trust is a social good, and it's unequally distributed in our society, just like other social goods, just like income, education, healthcare, and so on. And the people, and I'm talking now about the generic social trust, not just the trust in institutions. The least trusting people or the people who, in many ways, think of it this way, have a damn good reason not to be trusted, right? It's the least of us who are the least trusting of us generally and of our institutions. Uh, and if you read, and I'm not, <laughs> I'm way out of my league talking about economics, the history of economics, but you know, Sayas and Piketty and others have, they know much more about how to measure economic inequality, but economic inequality declined in the United States for the first half of the 20th century. Uh, from the Gilded Era um, through the Progressive Era, e economic inequality, as I understand it, as they measured, I, I could be wrong about this, but I understand it to have declined. And economic inequality began rising again in the 1960s and 70s, around the same time that these institutional declines began. And I wonder whether that's cause or effect. And I wonder, Reverend Walton, whether you'd, you'd speak about that. Thank you both. Uh, fabulous discussion. Alan, what were the three most polarizing uh, uh, issues? One was higher education. Higher education is, is new because even just a decade ago, attitudes toward higher education were not deeply politically partisan. Yeah. Now, as 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 I'm sure all of you know, um, Republicans and Democrats have very different attitudes toward higher education, and uh, Republicans are much more skeptical of higher education than Democrats. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court has become more polarized, um, and uh, interestingly, um, it has trust in the Supreme Court has declined on both both sides, despite you know overall, but it's become much more polarized. And um, media. Uh, as you won't be surprised to know, has also become deep. Well, trust in media that. has become yeah. deeply polarized. Huh. I can go. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, fine. Uh, I, I think for a long time, polarization or differences in opinion didn't matter that much because they weren't that deep. We had a lot of disagreements, but you know, political scientists back 20 years ago said, pointed out, hey, but they're not that deep. You know, we, we, we actually work together reasonably well. And I think all of that has uh, sort of disappeared. Whether we're at a point that we should be talking seriously about the possible breakup of the country, I, I think that's premature. It, it sold a lot of books, but I'm, I think it is pretty premature. However, I think we've reached a point where the level of polarization is quite dangerous. And it it, it is it's pulling us apart at, a, at a, an accelerating pace. And I just have a lot of concern. Michelle and I talked about this last night. You know, where our politics will go, will go here, if the Republicans went back to the House, I think it'll be very difficult for Biden to govern. Um, she believes it's probably a little easier. But nonetheless, then you go into 2024, there's a good chance that Biden won't run or he'll be persuaded by his party not to run. They will then, the party, if that happens, there's going to be a huge fight over the Kamala Harris question that could easily split the Republican, the Democratic Party apart. Uh, and so you can see gradually things could get easily worse or they alternatively, there is a there is a Trump victory or there's a Trump lookalike victory, you know, DeSantis or someone like that. 
uh, you know, r continues to rise as he is. Um, when, when in the 60s, I remember you used to talk about the most dangerous thing this country could have was a smart George Wallace. You know, it, and it, it, DeSantis is a smart DeSantis. It's, and it's worth knowing that. And given all that, our politics, could, this could be a very, very rough period. And I, I just think almost inevitably it's going to have rough edges. And I'm not sure where we come out. But they, that does not mean in the long term. You know, they're, they're going to be, you know, a variety of groups that are growing up, like your own discussions about how do we have, how do we create a better country? How do we create a better society? Um, and what needs to be done? I think there, I, th I, th my sense is that there's going to be a response that's going to be probably not very well organized. Um, but there, and I'm not sure going to the streets is the only way to go put pressure on the system. I think there's got to be like voting and, whatever Stacey Abrams winds up doing. But I, I do think that the rest of us have to be mindful that this, that what we're leaving behind could, could really be dangerous for our kids and our grandkids. Um, and that, I don't think we're anywhere close to getting out of this or t close to turning it around. Can I ask you a quick follow-up? But long-term, I, I, as I said yesterday or this morning, I, I'm, I'm more optimistic about the long-term. Or more, not not more optimistic. I'm more hopeful <laughs> about, so about the long term. Yeah. Do Jonathan, we'll do it, and then we'll get to, to, to yeah. Alan's question to Jonathan. But, but okay, okay, yeah. I just wanted to follow up on the DeSantis comment. <laughs> um, you mentioned DeSantis as a Trump uh, copycat. Um, I'm curious, actually, for both of you to comment on this. Um, do you consider somebody like DeSantis or any of the other Trump copycats to be as serious? or existential a threat to dem American democracy as Trump is? Uh, or do you consider them to be uh, similar in some ways, but not as much of a, a potential existential threat capable of doing something like January 6th? Well, I, I would have to say, I think it's almost certain that if Dema uh, DeSantis were elected, he would be much more polarizing than what we've seen so far that that's just sort of built into the, to the equation. Uh, and, you know, he's, he's, he's pretty wily. He's, he's, he's come a long way very, very fast. And I don't see anybody else in the Republican Party who comes close to, you know, I, some people think Pompeo will be, um, who's now lost 60 pounds or whatever it is, that he's, that he's a smarter guy than it looks, and you ought to keep an eye on him. That may be true, but I think DeSantis has really, uh, you know, there's a division you find here in Florida uh, about it. Most people are for DeSantis, but people you would think were not terribly interested or were sort of center right. They're all the way over on DeSantis. I, I, I'm astonished when I have some conversation with people I otherwise think are pretty bright that they can't say enough good things about him. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's strange and odd. And I think, um, as I say again, I think it threatens much deeper polarization. I guess that it becomes much harder to get out of it. Um, it becomes much harder to put together coalitions that rise above. I mean, where, where do we find uh, on the right now people who can escape the Trump deal and still be a viable person? You know, if Romney were 10 years younger, I think he would be one of the kinds of people you'd look to. All right, so moving from political candidates to religious renewal or growth back in the day and how did it, where did it come from? Maybe that'll close us out, John. Yeah, um, I mean, great question, Alan. I, I mean, I have to say in terms of the rise of, you know, church membership and affiliation in the 20th century, I mean, I don't wanna, you know, speak in terms of beyond my own kind of knowledge base of, about that. There's a couple of theories out there. One, for example, uh, like Kevin Cruz, his book, One Nation Under God, he talks about how there was a kind of a larger ideological framework, right? That, that where political and corporate business interests, right? Kind of were a part of that and, and promoting uh, in this kind of Cold War sensibility, right? Um, promoting church membership, right? Um, there's, I actually tend to come down more on that it's a matter of kind of mobility, 
and mobility and creating what some social theorists call kind of imagined communities. When we see increased mobility in American society, Darren Dochuk, for example, has this book called uh, From Bible Belt to Sun Belt, right? And it, and it was as white evangelical migrants began to move that they began to affiliate, right, with like-minded people and that helped spur church growth membership. That would be more consistent with what we saw within African-American communities within the 20th century. And I have to say, African-Americans start off at a very different place due to the logics of segregation, right? Um, and so the kind of quote unquote church state divide based upon the logics of Jim Crow, you don't have that level of divide because the religious center, right, becomes such a social center. Uh, uh, some refer to it as a nation within a nation, right? And so therefore at, at local congregations, that's where you had, uh, that's where you had the printed press, right? That's where you had uh, political organizing takes place. That's where you had black women's club movements and affiliation all housed within these congregations. And then of course, with the great migration, um, you had congregations that were leaving the South that were moving to urban areas, not just in the North, but whether it was to Atlanta or Birmingham or to Chicago, often congregations were moving together and then affiliating with other congregations, creating these kind of imagined communities. That's how you get places like Chicago described as quote unquote up South, right? Because the, the churches, helped to kind of recreate Southern communities. And that contributed to the kind of rise in church membership and an explosion. We think of quote unquote mega churches as a late 20th century phenomenon, but that's actually more of a mid 20th century phenomenon. And so much of it had to do uh, with the great migration and the kind of imagined communities uh, that were the social welfare sites or, you know, were the, were the sites of education, were the sites of uh, journalism within African-American communities, uh, churches being at the center. And so I would, I would attribute it to kind of to more about mobility in the mid 20th century while nodding and gesturing to these other kind of ideological as, as it relates to political and corporate interests. Really great start. Thanks to our speakers, David and John. Thank you.